Good morning. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to um, welcome everybody to this webinar where we'll be talking about cross-border relief in patent cases uh, and the impact of the activists and Eli Lilly, Solvay and Honeywell cases uh, and the Unified Patents Court. I'm very pleased to be joined uh, by my colleague uh, and partner, Adita Kamler, who is in, in our Munich office and is presently in our Munich office. Uh, and Dieter is, uh, like myself, a, a patent litigation speci specialist. Um, two, 2012 uh, and 2013 have seen some very interesting developments uh, in this area uh, relating to the territorial nature of patents. Uh, as uh, as is well known, uh, regulation, European uh, Union Regulation 1257-2012 uh, introduced at the end of last year the unitary patent, uh, but that will not come into being until the entry into force of the uh, agreement relating to the Unified Patents Court, which although now, now signed by 24 countries, uh, will require 13, at least 13 ratifications. In the meantime, all patents in Europe will be national, uh, and of course, even after the unitary patent uh, finally arrives, national patents will continue to coexist with it. The, the, the key questions that we're going to try and address in today's webinar are as follows. Uh, firstly, in what circumstances will the courts now entertain pan-European actions for declarations of non-infringement. Second, when will cross-border preliminary injunctions be available and what criteria will the courts apply? Third, what is the cu current status of the Italian torpedo? And finally, will things be the same or different under the Unified Patents Court? Uh, I plan to handle the first topic uh, by explaining the reasoning behind the activist and Lilly decision, which of course is an English law development, uh, Dieter will comment on the ef effect in Germany of a cross-border declaration granted by the English court, and he will also deal with the question as to whether cross-border declarations might be available from the German court, whether or not that's possible. Dieter will then handle the, cross the, the question of cross-border preliminary injunctions in the light of the Solvay case and the uh, p present position on Italian torpedoes, uh, that, that the, the torpedo having had more of a role perhaps in German infringement actions than it has so far in the UK. And as we go through, we will attempt to pick up uh, the anticipated position on each of these issues uh, on the, uh, when the Unified Patents Court uh, finally comes into being. So firstly, just a, a very quick history uh, as to cross-border relief uh, in uh, intellectual property and cases and patents in particular. Uh, intellectual property litigation historically has been rather parochial. The courts have traditionally been reluctant to adjudicate on matters uh, which it considers are essentially foreign uh, and local, such as real estate and uh, intellectual property. I mean, even in the early 1990s, the English courts were expressing reluctance to determine issues on foreign patents, and there are some well-known statements in one of our Court of Appeal cases in the mid-1990s, Plastus Creative against 3M, where Lord Justice Aldous expressed in particular his reluctance at dealing with infringement questions of a German patent. Now, the so-called Brussels Convention uh, changed all this. Now, as is well known, uh, the Brussels Convention was signed, it was actually signed uh, at the end of the 1960s, but it actually took several years to be implemented. And the idea of that was to prescribe a rigid set of rules uh, allocating jurisdiction between the courts of the different uh, signatory countries, which is essentially um, Euro European countries, uh, to be applied, and those rules were to be applied uniformly by all the courts. The aim, of course, was to cut down on forum shopping. Um, the 
Brussels Convention was not specific to intellectual property by any means and covered all litigation, although, as we shall see, there is one particular provision concerned with exclusive jurisdiction that is specific to registered IP, such as patents. And that particular provision has played a significant role in the development of cross-border, development or absence of uh, cross-border relief uh, in uh, patent cases. The Brussels Convention was uh, later embodied in a European regulation, Regulation 44-2001, which we'll, uh, we will be talking about uh, in some detail in the course of this webinar. Uh, and very recently, in fact, the 2001 regulation has been replaced with an updated version, which is Regulation 1215-2012, which was, uh, implement which was um, came into force on the 12th of December 2012. Um, but for present purposes, um, the provisions that concern the subject matter of this webinar are essentially the same, although the precise numbering of the articles has changed. Uh, in this webinar, we'll, we'll use the numbering in the 2001 regulation, um, as that is the numbering that um, appeared in the uh, two judgments we are discussing. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, so finally, the final piece of uh, history on this particular slide is the um, EPLA initiative, uh, which uh, was an attempt uh, to um, develop a system of bringing uh, one set of proceedings to resolve all issues across Europe, developed by the well-known or led by the well-known Dutch judge, Judge Willems. Uh, but ultimately, it founded uh, in 2007 uh, as uh, a, a result on, on legal grounds. As it, it was not developed within the aegis of the EU institutions. So, just bringing things a little bit more up to date uh, and mentioning a couple more landmarks: uh, two cases in 2006 by the European Court of Justice. Uh, the first one was the, the case of Gat Look, uh, which clarified that uh, in, any, in any patent case, whether it concerned uh, infringement uh, or not, whether it was just a nullity case or whether infringement, if infringement case with validity raised as a defense, uh, it clarified that in any patent case in which validity is raised, it's subject to the exclusive jurisdiction of the court where the patent is registered. Uh, and um, it Gat and Look thereby resolved an issue as to the impact of uh, the exclusive jurisdiction provision, Article 22.4 of 2001, uh, which prescribes that, where, uh, that the courts where the patents have been registered shall have the exclusive jurisdiction over, quote, proceedings concerned with validity. And the case clarified that that phrase covered, for example, infringement proceedings where, where validity was raised as a defense. And in fact, the um, uh, conclusion of GAT look has now found its way expressly into the corresponding wording of the new regulation 1215-2012. Uh, and that now expressly uses the phrase, irrespective of whether the issue is raised by way of action or as a defense. Uh, the second milestone in 2006 was the decision in Rosham Primas by the um, European Court of Justice, which clarified uh, the claims based on different national parts of the same European patent against various different companies belonging to the same group do not have a sufficiently close connection with one another to justify joinder in a single set of proceedings under Article 6 of Regulation 2001. Uh, and again, um, the um, Roche uh, effectively dealt with the means by which the Dutch courts uh, had managed to join non-Dutch subsidiaries alleged at, uh, to uh, infringe foreign de designations of an EP patent, and uh, joined it into a case in which there was a Dutch defendant alleged to infringe the Dutch designation. As they Roche said, the fact that the, the, there were several designations, uh, subsidiaries all from the same group, did not mean that those parallel infringement cases were sufficiently close to justify 
joinder in a single set of proceedings. Uh, much more recently, last year, we had the, the very interesting case of Lucas and Ainsworth, uh, where the English Supreme Court held that the English courts could entertain an action for infringement of U.S. copyright in relation to the uh, well-known Imperial Stormtrooper helmet from the Star Wars film, uh, and thereby reversing previous English decisions uh, where the English courts had declined to entertain claims for infringement of copyright uh, in, uh, well, sorry, U.S. copyright uh, in relation to, for example, um, Conan Doyle's novels about Sherlock Holmes. So there's a clear move in Lucas and Hainsworth uh, away from the traditional view that adjudicating on um, even non-EU IP rights uh, was something that they were more willing to do. It wasn't something that was just simply local uh, and foreign and should be left to the courts of other countries. Uh, activists and Lilly and Solvay and Honeywell are the two cases we'll be discussing uh, in, further in this webinar. Uh, and finally, on, on that, uh, uh, the, the latest development is, uh, of course, February of this year, when finally the agreement on the Unified Patents Court was signed by 24 states. So, first, activists and Eli Lilly, which is a decision of Mr. Justice Arnold, one of the English patents judges, uh, in November of 2012. So what were the facts? Well, the, the patent concerned, the 508 patent, was directed to the use of pemetrexid disodium in combination therapy for inhibiting tumor growth. Uh, subsequent to some uh, correspondence earlier in the month, on July the 17th, 2012, activists issued proceedings in the English court seeking uh, declarations. Uh, firstly, pursuant to Section 71 of the uh, English Patents Act 1977, that its dealings in pemetrexid dipotassium in the, in the UK would not infringe. And um, interestingly, uh, and the central point of this part of the webinar, um, pursuant to the court's inherent jurisdiction, uh, that such dealings in France, Germany, Italy, and Spain would not infringe either. Um, on the 1st of August 2012, activists sought to serve the English proceedings on Lilly's lawyer, uh, pursuant to a previous consent in correspondence. And in fact, it was, it was a letter that was written by um, Lilly's lawyers the day before, where they said that they had, they confirmed that they had instructions to accept service. And one of the issues that arose was how far did that consent extend? Did it extend just to proceedings in relation to the UK patent, or did it extend to proceedings that might actually cover other de designations of the EP508 patent as well? So on the 30th of July 2012, uh, Lilly issued proceedings in Dusseldorf, uh, alleging infringement based on the threatened infringement uh, by activists of the German designation of the 508 patent. Uh, and the 9th of August, uh, Lilly served the German proceedings. And again, um, the, the German proceedings are only concerned with the German designation. Activists in Germany challenged jurisdiction on the basis that the issue of whether or not the patent was infringed in Germany was already uh, before the court in the UK, the so-called Lis Alibi Pendens. Uh, on the 29th of August, uh, Lilly applied to the English court for declarations that the English court did not have or alternatively should not exercise jurisdiction in respect of the French, German, Italian, and Spanish designations. On the 11th of October, uh, as a sort of precaution uh, or as an alternative basis for service, activists sent a claim form, uh, sent a claim form and other initial court documents uh, to Lilly's patent department uh, in the UK. Um, this is uh, because Lilly had, in the meantime, disputed service of the foreign, the, the claim insofar as it concerned the non-UK designations. But of course, activists sent um, the claim form to Lilly's patent department without prejudice 
to its position that Lilly had already been validly served uh, at the beginning of August. Now, there are a few important points to note at the outset. Firstly, uh, there was no assertion of the patent made by Lilly. Now, it, it compare here the requirements of English and, for example, German law regarding uh, claims for declarations of non-infringement. Um, the UK has a wide jurisdiction re regarding jurisdictions, uh, regarding declarations. Under Section 71 of the Patents Act 19, uh, 1977, it is sufficient that the party seeking the declaration has, prior to bringing the claim, um, provided full particulars in writing that the proposed acts do not infringe. And in the absence of an acknowledgement that they don't infringe, uh, the uh, party then has standing to bring a declaration. Furthermore, uh, in, uh, it's clear in, in light of several recent cases um, that the court is, has a wide and powerful inherent jurisdiction which allows declarations to be made when the court considers they serve a useful purpose. Uh, and in other contexts, um, the, this has been the basis for the jurisdiction, for example, on which the, the English court is prepared to give declarations of non-essentiality in standard essential cases, for example, in, in telecoms. The second important point to note is that activists did not seek to challenge validity in the English court, um, although it did intervene uh, in Teva's uh, European Patent Office appeal. Uh, hence, uh, the provision in Regulation 44-2001 uh, that provides that when validity is raised uh, in relation to a European patent, that is the subject that is the subject of the exclusive jurisdiction where that designation is registered, and that is the subject matter of the Gap Look case we we talked about a moment ago. So activists um, avoided the overriding exclusive jurisdiction of 22.4 by saying we're not going to challenge validity of the. Uh, of, of the patents in, in these proceedings. Now, the third point that was important to this is that the patentee was a U.S. corporation, Eli Lilly and Company, and hence Articles 2, 5, and 6 of Regulation 2001 uh, did not apply. And those are the articles that um, arrange jurisdiction when the defendant is an EU domiciled uh, company. So we're out, outside the regime of Articles 2, 5, and the 6. The fourth point, um, therefore, was that, as a consequence, the jurisdiction uh, is um, as to whether or not the court had jurisdiction to determine the question of in infringement or non-infringement of the non-UK rights is a matter of national law, and that's provided for in Article 4 of the regulation. And finally, it's worth mentioning that the appeal uh, on, on the Arnold decision uh, is to be heard at the end of uh, April 2013, in fact, next week. And uh, we will be monitoring that uh, closely, of course, and uh, we'll provide an update as soon as um, we, we hear further. And uh, it'll be very interesting to see whether the Court of Appeal uh, will find anything uh, at fault with Mr. Justice Arnold's reasoning. So, uh, firstly, uh, Lilly uh, disputed service. And, and as I mentioned, there were two, two main methods of service adopted by activists, and we'll come on to those um, in, in a moment. Um, and if, well, in fact, uh, the, the expanding slightly in relation to the, uh, the, the um, consent that Lilly's lawyers gave to service, there was a letter the day before uh, activists served the proceedings which said, we, are conf we confirm we're instructed to accept service. And Lilly, after the proceedings had been served, contended that the consent did not extend to the foreign designations. Uh, and the letter was, in fact, in response to activists' lawyers' first letter that had requested an acknowledgement that all acts in each and all jurisdictions where the patent was in force um, were, didn't infringe and requested acknowledgements. Uh, and uh, on the particular facts and having... Uh, uh, construed the correspondence, Mr. Justice Arnold held 
that the consent in Lily's lawyer's letter um, should properly be construed to cover uh, an action including the non-UK designations. So that on that basis, um, the question of service came to an end and the UK court had jurisdiction to uh, entertain the declarations of non-infringement of the, UK, the non-UK designations. However, if he was wrong on that, he went on to hold uh, that the um, that Lily was validly served under Civil Procedure Rule 6.92. In other words, uh, the Lily had a Lily US had a place of business in the UK uh, in the form of its European Patent Operations Department uh, in Windlesham. The judge considered a variety of factors and attached weight to such things as the uh, the U- UK head attorney had authority to enter into contracts on. Lily US's behalf, uh, for example, with external attorneys, as well as authority to pay uh, renewal and application fees. And all these things were done for Lily US from the premise, premises at Windlesham. And the senior, uh, at, at senior patent attorney from Wimbledon, Windlesham um, had an email signature, uh, sorry, his business card, an email signature, and speaker biography, um, all put him forward as representing the U.S. Uh, corporation. So on the, on, on, in the light of all those factors, the judge held that, that Lilly U.S. had a place of business at Windlesham, and hence the delivery of the claim form there was valid service. Um, the, the judge, on that alternative basis of service, the judge had to consider whether or not um, uh, Lily's request for a stay uh, that on the grounds of forum non-convenience should be refused. Uh, and the judge said he was not persuaded that there was a more suitable forum in the UK to hear the claim, given that the English court um, was going to exercise jurisdiction over the UK patent anyway. So why instruct additional teams of lawyers in other countries, even though the French, German, etc., patents would have to be the subject of uh, French, German, etc. law, but applied in the English proceedings. However, the law is, is not that different. Uh, so uh, it, it, the judge concluded that, in fact, the English court was the most suitable um, court to entertain these proceedings. And so Lily's request for a stay uh, on, the ba- on, on those grounds uh, was refused. And it's worth just mentioning in passing that the um, issue of foreign, foreign non-convenience is very much an English national concept and doesn't arise uh, when you're into the, re- the part of the Brussels regulation uh, when you are considering a defendant who is domiciled within the EU. And just a final point to mention on service uh, is that the judge also made clear that service of proceedings relating to um, non-UK patents cannot be affected by service of the claim form at the address for service that is recorded on the register uh, at the UK Intellectual Property Office. So serving at the address for service on the register of proceedings in relation to non-UK rights is not sufficient. So an important question that arises from this uh, is, would the outcome in activists and Lilly have been the same or different if the patentee was domiciled in an EU member state. Now, we're into the different parts of the Brussels regulation and have to consider uh, the provisions that normally arise or or normally are relevant when you have uh, a patentee or defendant domiciled in the EU. Article 2.1, which is now Article 4.1 under the 2012 version, provides that, um, it, that subject to this regulation, persons domiciled in a member state shall, whatever their nationality, be sued in the courts of that member state. So that is a starting point. It's the so-called defendant plays at home rule. So starting point is you sue a French company in France, an English company in England, and so forth. But then Article 3.1 says that persons domiciled in the member state may be sued in the courts of another member state only by virtue of rules set out in sections 2 to 7 of this chapter. Uh, And there are 
two others that arise in patent cases. The first one is Article 5.3, uh, which is the one that provides that um, a person domiciled in a member state may be sued in another member state in matters relating to tort, and of course patent infringement is a tort, uh, in the courts of the place where the harmful event occurs. So in other words, you can sue a French company in England if the French company is infringing in England, and so on. Uh, however, that, this particular provision does not help when it comes to trying to grant jurisdiction in relation to a patent that is registered in uh, a member state other than the court uh, that you are concerned with. So 5.3 doesn't help in relation to the cross-border nature uh, of the claim. Uh, 6.1 uh, is, uh, as we've mentioned earlier, uh, a provision that has been um, well, it's been an attempt in the past to, to, to use Article 6.1 as a means to join uh, further parties, other subsidiaries across Europe who may be sued in relation to the corresponding designation. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, it is, it is clear from the ECJ decision in Roche in 2006 that different national parts of the same European patent alleged to be infringed by various companies in the same group uh, is not a sufficiently close connection to justify joinder. So Article 6.1 isn't going to help either. Uh, and just a little note there to give you the, the new article numbers from the 2012 regulation. Uh, from, from the point of view of the articles that we're concerned with, it's simply a matter of, of adding two. So Article 2.1 becomes 4.1, 3.1 becomes 5.1, and so on. Uh, but the overall conclusion uh, so the question is that the English court will not in general entertain actions for cross-border declarations of non-infringement against an EU patentee, um, but see later specifically as to the UK patentee, because that is, that is a special case. But in general, where you've got a, a, an EU patentee, uh, the English court will not uh, entertain jurisdiction of cross-border declarations of non-infringement. So some conclusions uh, in relation to um, cross-border declarations of non-infringement from the UK. And these are conclusions put forward, of course, subject to next, week, ne next week's appeal. And we shall see, and we await with interest, to see whether any modification uh, will be required. Uh, but the English court will potentially entertain declarations cross-border, uh, sorry, entertain applications for cross-border declarations of non-infringement provided first the patentee is domiciled either outside the UK, like Lily US, or in the UK. Second, uh, the claim can be validly served. So for example, for a non-EU patentee, does it have a place in business, place of business uh, in the UK? Of course, no problem if it is a UK company because that's very easy to serve in the UK. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the judge in the activist case held that you cannot serve proceedings relating to non-UK designations of an EP patent at the address for service uh, at the UK, uh, uh, set out on the UK register. Uh, and also, uh, unlike with an infringement action, there is in fact no basis even to, on which to seek permission from the court to serve a declaratory action outside the UK, EU. So you're really looking at um, place of business in the UK if it's a non-EU patentee uh, or if it's a UK company itself. Well, you may be fortunate in that the patentee's lawyers will consent to service. Uh, so the third condition is that there will be no challenge to validity because, of course, once validity is raised, it becomes an exclusive matter for the courts where that designation is registered. And uh, again, just to, to reiterate that in the UK, there is no requirement of an assertion of the patent before the jurisdiction to seek a declaration of non-infringement is, is grounded. Compare with the law in Germany. And the final conclusions are that, that the patentee should, of course, take care before consenting to service of claims for declarations of non-infringement to ensure that any consent that it's given only concerns the UK designation. Uh, if consent to service related to non-UK patents has been considered, patentees should reserve the right to challenge jurisdiction, but note, 
it may be difficult, as it was in the activist case, to show that the UK court is not uh, forum non-convenience. So even if you dispute the um, proceedings on that basis, uh, on, the, on the grounds that the judge uh, fa found that the U UK court was a convenient forum, likely to arise again in many cases. Uh, and finally, um, in standard essential patent cases, uh, pan-European declarations of non-essentiality may be available from the English court, subject again to the previously mentioned uh, three provisos. So thank you very much for uh, listening. Uh, I will now hand over to Dieter, uh, who will start by considering the effect in Germany uh, of a cross-border declaration of non-infringement granted by the court of another uh, member state. Oh, hello. This is Dieter Kammler. I'm speaking from Munich. Uh, uh, thank you for joining, and thank you, James, for introducing uh, already the UK position. The question is, of course, will the UK judgment now also be binding on the German courts if the UK High Court decided on the non-infringement of the German designation of the patent? And the general answer would be yes, because judgments from other EU member states courts generally have effect in all other member states under the Brussels regulation now 1215 of 2012. However, to pour some water into the wine already, uh, German courts are very strict when it comes to assessing whether it's really the identical case and especially strict if it comes to the identity of the parties. So different affiliates of the same group of companies are generally treated as different parties in Germany, which seems also to be the position of the ECJ as seen in the Roche against Primus case. So a DNI judgment from a other European court would only be binding on the German court if the parties in the proceedings are fully identical. So if the party that would sue us for patent infringement in Germany would be included in the DNI judgment as a party, and if the party that would be accused of patent infringement in, in Germany as defendant would be a plaintiff also in the previous action for declaratory judgment. So you have to include the German affiliates uh, of the patentee as well of, as of the potential defendant um, in the foreign DNI case to make sure you get a decision that's binding on German courts. Especially, it's quite customary for patentees to start uh, infringement proceedings in Germany via the German affiliate under an exclusive patent license. And in that case, the German affiliate of the patentee would have to be a defendant in the action for a declaratory judgment of non-infringement. But as soon as you add the German affiliate as defendant, you have uh, a defendant domiciled in a EU member state, and then the Brussels regulation becomes applicable. And as James explained already, uh, under the Brussels regulation, uh, the UK courts would not entertain uh, actions for cross-border uh, DNI action for non-infringement of foreign designations of a European patent. So let's turn things the other way around. Could you sue for an action of uh, non-infringement in Germany? Is this available in Germany? Generally, yes. You can also start a DNI action in Germany, but uh, that requires a clear allegation of patent infringement. So the plaintiff wanting to get a declaration of non-infringement has to show that there was a clear allegation of patent infringement against him or at least a customer or supplier. And that would be required for just the patent that is going to be part of the DNI action. So if you want to assert a French designation of a European patent and ask for declaration of non-infringement, you have to show that infringement, especially of this French declaration, has been alleged. This makes it very hard to bring uh, declaratory actions in Germany. And there's also no forum convenience rule. So if you have an allegation for the German designation of the patent, you could not just add the French and English or Dutch designation of the same patent to your action. Again, this has to be assessed for each part of the European patent separately. 
and generally cross-border jurisdiction under the German law rules would require a defendant domiciled in Germany. So, <clears throat> uh, and the last point is that uh, as soon as the patentee then decides to bring the reverse infringement action, the DNI action would automatically become moot. So the declaratory judgment action is not a good way to prevent a German infringement action, uh, and it's from the first place very hard to get even started on this. Uh, and of course, at last, German courts are seen as rather patent-friendly, so it's not the primary forum to start DNI actions, and we usually do not recommend it. What would be the position under the Unified Patent Court? Of course, uh, a declaratory judgment would always have cross-border effect because under Article 4 of the, uh, 34 of the UPC agreement, <clears throat> all decisions take effect in all states where the European patent is validated or in all member states of the UPC if it's a u unitary patent. The uh, DNI action is admissible under Article 32.1b. It's explicitly listed and it would have to be brought in the central division according to Article 33, Paragraph 4 of the UPC agreement. Similar to the German rules, however, the DNI action would be stayed as soon as the patentee starts the reverse infringement action within a deadline of three months. And the patentee would not be bound to start that in the central division. That could be started in any local or regional division of the Unified Patent Court, which has jurisdiction for the uh, respective infringement action. And this rule is extended under Article 33, Paragraph 6, UPC Agreement, to exclusive licensees to the patentee, so the DNI action would also be stayed if an exclusive licensee starts the reverse infringement action. So that's similar to the German rules. What is good in the UPC Agreement and similar to the UK rules is that to start a declaratory action, you do not have to prove that there was a previous allegation of patent infringement under draft uh, rule. That's still a draft of the rules of procedure. Rule 60 provides that uh, a third party can write a letter asking for a statement that a certain patent is not infringed. And if the patentee refuses to give this acknowledgement within one month, the declaratory action can be started, and that can be a tool to just clear the way for new products. So, take it now from the other side. Uh, from the patentee's perspective, what can you do to enforce your patent? Uh, how can you start cross-border proceedings? Here we have, of course, uh, the important uh, ECJ ruling survey against Honeywell of last year which confirmed uh, cross-border jurisdiction in certain constellations. So Solvay, as a plaintiff, brought proceedings in the Netherlands against three defendants. One was the Dutch subsidiary of Honeywell, located in the Netherlands, and then they added two Belgian subsidiaries of Honeywell and accused all three defendants of infringing their European patent, uh, especially the Dutch designation of this patent, but also the national designations of the European patents in other countries, including Germany, France, and so on. And in addition, Solvay applied to a preliminary cross-border injunction, uh, whereas Honeywell raised the defense of invalidity for all national parts of the patent. The Dutch court then stayed proceedings and referred two questions to the ECJ. Question number one was, does, do the Dutch courts have jurisdiction uh, also for the Belgian subsidiaries of Honeywell, which do not have um, a place of residence in the UK, so do they still have cross-border jurisdiction for that? And the ECJ confirmed, uh, because uh, here, other than in the Roche Primus case, all three defendants were accused of infringing the same national part of the European patents. So that's a close connection of the cases that would create a risk of irreconcilable judgments if they were dealt with in different courts. And in that situation, uh, the ECJ said you have standing, you can add foreign defendants to the action if you have a cross border jurisdiction for one defendant because it's a domiciled in the state where the action is brought. 
So that was new. That would apply not only for preliminary proceedings, but also for proceedings on the merits. The second issue was the invalidity defense raised by Honeywell, because under regulation, uh, the Brussels regulation, Article 22, the courts where the national designations of the European patents are registered have exclusive jurisdiction. And here, uh, the ECJ distinguished the case over the primus, prior uh, Gutt Look case and said in preliminary proceedings, the Dutch courts can still rule on the invalidity, provided they do not give a final and binding, binding decision on the validity of foreign designations of the same European patent. This is not a change for proceedings on the merits, where also the validity would have to be decided final and binding. That is still not possible cross-border. So, as I already mentioned, these two aspects of the ECJ ruling, which is suing several defendants uh, cross-border in one court, uh, and the second one is, uh, is the, does the invalidity defense prevent preliminary measures are entirely separate. So the joining several defendants is also possible in proceedings on the merits. And the cross-border preliminary injunction is also possible if you have just one defendant. It's also uh, important to note that the ECJ ruled on the jurisdiction of the court but not on the applicable law or any other patent law matters. The question was just whether the Dutch courts have standing, uh, have, can take the case and have jurisdiction. And it's also important to note that the ECJ said this does only apply where there's no, uh, no reasonable, non negligible possibility that the patent could be invalidated. So as soon as there's a likelihood that the patent might be invalidated, there's no more room for cross-border preliminary injunction. That's a new requirement defined by the ECJ, and that would be applicable wherever the preliminary injunction application is filed. And it's also important that the Dutch court cannot just look whether the patent is valid under Dutch standards, but if it's cross-border, for example, for the French designation, they would have to make a prediction whether the patent will also be valid under French standards. So, what's uh, the rules? How will cross-border preliminary injunctions be played? First of course, of all, of course, you have to satisfy the ECJ test for cross-border injunctions, so no reasonable likelihood of invalidity of the patent, only then the way to cross-border preliminary injunction is open. The material law for the infringement case and the remedies will the, be the national law in all the different EP states concerned. So for the French designation of the patent, you will have to assess infringement under French national law, and for the available remedies, the case will have to be decided also under French national law. The same is true for the German designation, you will have to apply German law on the infringement and on the remedies. So even though it's now a cross-border case in one court, uh, the court still has to uh, apply a wide set of different national rules of law. Of course, uh, some parts of this law are harmonized, of course, in the European Patent Convention, as far as the patents are concerned, but also in the European Enforcement Directive, that's Directive 48 of 2004. Under this directive, a uh, great part of the remedies are now harmonized so that it might be easier for a court to give a cross-border injunction. The procedural law that is applicable, however, is the law of the court. So when it comes to certain requirements of interim relief, like showing irreparable harm of the applicant wanting interim relief, or the balancing of interests of the parties, or in Germany, the requirement that the case is urgent, that the patentee acted without undue delay. These requirements would be assessed by the court under its national law. And for example, when a German court would grant an interim injunction for the French designation of the European patent, it would not apply French procedural law on the interim relief. What would it be like under the Unified Patent Court? Of course, 
any judgment of the unified patent court will have automatically have cross-border effect. That's the main purpose of this court under Article 34. For provisional and protective measures, the UPC has jurisdiction under Article 32, Paragraph 1c, and the jurisdiction is with the different local or regional divisions uh, that have jurisdiction also for the infringement actions on the merits. So as a rule of thumb, if a division can take the case infringement case on the merits, it will also have jurisdiction for the pre, uh, preliminary injunction. There are additional rules in the UPC on provisional measures in Article 62 that provides that the court has to make uh, a balancing of interests of the parties concerned and the potential harm on the side of the applicant and the defendant. And Article 62 also refers to the provisions on the seizure of evidence, especially those provisions in, art, in paragraphs 5 to 9 of Article 60, which allow for ex parte measures that can be important, and for the requirement of a security bond to be posted by the applicant in case the injunction is later lifted and the defendant suffered harm by the preliminary injunction. Uh, another question is, uh, the provisional measures under the UPC would be admissible even if an, a DNI action had already been brought in a national court before. That is clear because the relationship between the UPC and the national courts is governed still by the Brussels regulation. And here under the new Article 35, formerly 31, preliminary measures are possible even if another court has exclusive jurisdiction or is already seized with that matter. We need to see how this uh, will develop because the Brussels regulation will be reviewed in the view of the uh, Unified Patent Court Agreement. Now let's come to the last topic. That's the Italian torpedo. That's uh, an old friend or foe uh, from which perspective you see it. It works, uh, it plays with the rules of the Brussels regulation, now Article 29, formerly Article 27. And these provisions say that if two courts in different European member states are seized with uh, the same action, the court first seized will decide whether it has jurisdiction and the court later seized has to stay the case and wait until the first court has decided over its jurisdiction. And that means if a potential defendant in an infringement case manages to file a DNI action in one court asking for a declaration of non-infringement and the infringement action is filed later than the infringement action if it's between the same parties and for the same patent has to be stayed until the court seized with the first declaratory action has decided whether it has jurisdiction. And no matter whether the DNI action was really filed in a court with jurisdiction to, to decide over the patent infringement, uh, the reverse infringement action is blocked under the Brussels regulation as long as the DNI action is pending. And that is used to file DNI actions in particularly slow courts uh, to just block the reverse infringement actions in perhaps quicker courts. How can you overcome an Italian torpedo that had been played in a case Visto against Rim, which was in the Düsseldorf District Court and Court of Appeal? Here the patentee Visto holds a family of European patents, including some divisionals, and the defendant Rim knew the case was coming and filed a DNI action against the patentee in Italy, which uh, was asking for a declaration of non-infringement for all of Europe, for a parent patent and all divisionals, and included, uh, I think, a whole family of RIM affiliates. Uh, in Germany, then, Visto brought proceedings not itself, but via its German affiliate, Visto GmbH, under an exclusive patent license, as I already mentioned, and it asserted not uh, the parent patent, but divisionals that had not been explicitly mentioned in the 
Italian DNI action. And in this uh, context, the uh, Düsseldorf courts uh, refused to stay the infringement proceedings to wait for the outcome of the Italian case. And they said, yes, in principle, even if the prior DNI action is an obvious torpedo and could even be abusive, they still have to wait under the Brussels regulation until the Italian court declined its jurisdiction and will not take a decision before that has happened. But they said this is only applicable if the conditions of Article 29 of the new Brussels regulation are met, if you have identity of the parties and identical claims. And here they said the parties are not identical. The exclusive licensee, Visto GmbH, has its own right of action and was not mentioned in the Italian DNI action. So a DNI judgment against the patentee would not extend to an exclusive licensee, uh, at least if it was granted the exclusive license before the DNI action was filed. Uh, also, there was no identity of claims because the three divisional patents uh, asserted in Germany were, according to the German courts, not sufficiently introduced into the Italian proceedings because there they were not mentioned. So they had two reasons to affirm they have jurisdiction and did not want to be held up, obviously, by this uh, torpedo. So the interesting question is perhaps what's the scope for Italian torpedoes once we have the unified patent court? So the parties drafting the UPC agreement thought of this issue and they made sure that there can be no torpedoes between different uh, divisions of the unified patent court. Actions for declaration of non-infringement are only possible in the central division. They do not prevent the reverse infringement action by the patentee, which can be filed in any local or regional division. And the prior DNI action is automatically stayed if the reverse infringement action is filed within three months. So in Germany, the reverse infringement action would always override the prior DNI action without any deadline in which it can be filed or the change in the UPCs that the patentee has to think within three months, make up his mind, do I want to enforce the patent, and then file the infringement action within three months, but then the DNI action will not be an obstacle. The interesting question is, could you still torpedo the UPC court if you file the DNI action not in the central division of the UPC, but if you file it in a national court, which perhaps has not uh, jurisdiction to hear the DNI case, but uh, could still block the case in the UPC from progressing. And currently under Article 31 of the UPC agreement, the international agreement of the UPC shall be governed by the Brussels regulation 1215 of 2012. And if that regulation is not changed substantially, especially not Article 29, uh, in a case where a national court is seized with a DNI action and the UPC is later seized with a reverse infringement action, the conflict would have to be resolved under the present Article 29 of the Brussels regulation. And that means the court first seized with a DNI action would have to decline its jurisdiction before the infringement action in the UPC could progress. And so if the Brussels regulation is not changed in this point. That means an Italian torpedo could even torpedo the entire UPC, uh, no matter whether the Italian court would actually have jurisdiction to hear cases on European patents, which are not opted out from the UPC, or even uh, unitary patents. Uh, the UP, the U unified patent court would be blocked just until the Italian court would have decided to dismiss the DNI action finally. So it could be, if there's no change of the law, that the Italian torpedo will stay with us, even in the new UPC. So I'm through with my slides. Thank, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask them. And we will also uh, 
answer questions by mail or individually, of course, after this webinar session has closed. And I just, just finally from me, um, James Marshall in London, I'd just like, also like to say thank you very much to, to everybody for uh, listening and staying with us to the end, end of this webinar. And we will, uh, as I said earlier, we will um, obviously be monitoring the activist case closely uh, and be providing uh, updates uh, when, when we know what the Court of Appeal um, does with it.